implement the marriage stuff or is the timing of it? When, when does it happen? So I think it's important to really look at that in a little more detail, or at least I think it's important. So we're going to read Revelation 19. We're going to look at 7, 8, 9 again. Again, this is this marriage supper, and we're going to kind of look at it in a little detail, not, not super much, but Revelation 19, 7 says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Okay, so in verse 7, we can establish that the Lamb is definitely Jesus Christ. There's no arguing that. The herself ready, sometimes people want to try to insert Israel there, but I'm going to show you tonight that Israel's definitely not that. And it's definitely the bride of Christ. You can read Ephesians 5 and just so many passages where it talks about the, the New Testament believing church will be the bride of Christ. So that's the players here. Christ is getting married to the church. Verse 8, and to her, that's the church, the bride, was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for fine linen is the righteous of the saints. We talked about that. And he saith unto me, write, blessed are they which are called uh, to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he that saith unto me, these are the true sayings of God. So that's John getting this vision from an angel. So I want us to look at, uh, we've established who's getting married. That's Jesus Christ, and he's marrying the church. This is the actual ceremony. We know the Lamb is Christ, we know the Bride of the Church, but when and where will this take place? You can study this online. You're normally going to get three teachings. Um, most of them are pre-trib teachings, which makes sense. Some are not, but most of them are pre-trib teachings, and they'll have the marriage taking place in heaven, but the marriage supper taking place on earth after we return. Um, there's so many commentaries, but I'm just going to give you the one that I think is right. Um, I think we can approve from Scripture that the marriage takes place in heaven and the marriage supper takes place in heaven. Okay, and we're going to look at that. And the only way we can really establish that is to understand, and I've said this before, that Jesus is following what? What pattern of, of marriage? The Jewish, yeah, right? Jewish. Okay, I've said that like a gazillion times. So he's followed it perfectly up to this point, so why would we think he's not going to continue to follow it, right? He, he is. His, he's perfect and everything he does is perfect. He's not us. Um, we like to get into things and then change up, right? Um, not Christ. He's going to follow everything to the jot and tittle. So there are three major steps in a Jewish marriage, okay? And again, I'm not going to give you every detail in a Jewish marriage, but three um, major steps. The first step was what? The betrothal, okay? And that's the establishment of the marriage covenant that bound the man and woman together as husband and wife. You can read in Matthew chapter 1, uh, that between Mary and Joseph, and I just want to read you some of these passages just to familiarize you with us. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused, that word espoused means betrothed, to Joseph. But notice the wording there, espoused. You would think they're already married. Betrothed, that was a marriage contract. They were married. They just haven't had the ceremony yet. They haven't consummated the marriage, okay, physically. But they were already considered married to Joseph before they came together. What does that mean? We're all adults here, right? We know what that means, but they came together. That's the consummation of the marriage. Uh, but that didn't happen until the ceremony, but they were espoused. They were yet to come together. Now, the Bible is very clear to say that. Why? Because Jesus was already born, and the Bible is making it very clear that Mary was a virgin. Jesus was born, but yet they had not consummated the marriage yet. Okay, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, in verse 19, not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. Joseph wouldn't have done that if he had come together with her and she had had the baby. So obviously she, he thought she got pregnant by somebody else, so the angel Gabriel came to him. But what I want to show you there is this betrothal process. So the first step in a Jewish marriage was man and woman meet, they are betrothed. That's a marriage covenant. The second step was taking the bride or wife by the groom um, from her house to the father's house. So I'm not going to read all this, but in Matthew 25 you read about the, the ten uh, virgins, five wise, five foolish. And in that text, you, you can read about this process of how the bridegroom would take the bride from her house to the father's house. And again, the essence of the marriage ceremony or the festivities was taken of the bride from her, from her house, from her father's house. He would take her and bring her to the house of the bridegroom or the father of the bridegroom. So what did Jesus say in John 14? I'm going to prepare a place for you. In my father's house are many houses is the correct interpretation. It's not mansions. So what is Jesus promising to do? Come and get the bride and do what? Come down here with us? Right. So he's not coming to earth to stay with us. So we know, and we'll look at the passages because people want to deny the rapture. I don't know why. 
Uh, it's in Scripture, but the Lord is going to come, and we're going to see He doesn't come to earth. The Bible says we do what? We meet Him in the air. Okay? So we'll talk about that in a minute. So the taking of the bride was usually done at night. Uh, you know, what does the Bible say in Matthew 24 concerning the rapture? Some will be sleeping, a thief in the night. That's a great answer in Thessalonians. The Bible says some will be sleeping, some will be awake. Why? Because if it's night here, it's not in Australia. So it can't be night everywhere. But maybe God loves us Americans so much. So that'd be nice, right, to do it while we're sleeping. Wouldn't that be nice? I can see John now. It's 9 o'clock already. Why's my alarm clock going off, right? It's a trumpet, John. It's normally done at night. Now, normally, again, the Lord says you won't know the day nor time. Now, he's saying you won't know the specific time, but we know in Scripture, he says you'll know about when. So the betrothal process, it was normally about a year, but again, it wasn't like to the day, but it was about a year. So she knew if it was getting to be about a year that her bridegroom, her groom, was going to return soon, and she was excited, and the bride was supposed to be doing what? Making herself ready, just like you're supposed to be doing, waiting for Christ, making yourself ready, doing good works that glorify him. Um, working out your salvation, things like that. So since the second step was the essence of the marriage ceremony, it was regarded as the wedding or the marriage. That was actually considered the wedding. When he came and got her, took her back to her, his house or his father's house. That was actually considered the wedding. Okay. In Matthew 22, verses 2 through 13, and Matthew 25, verse 10, you can see all these examples. But, so that was the second step that corresponds to the expression found in Revelation 19.7, when we read in, in Revelation 19.7 about the marriage of the Lamb, you don't see supper there, right? You just see marriage of the Lamb. I want you to make, make this very clear because people get this very confused. So that means the church is already in heaven. He's brought us there. We're at, that's the marriage. I, when the rapture happens, just for the timeline, when the trumpet blows and the rapture happens and we're in the presence of Christ, that's the marriage. We're already betrothed. I, I don't think a lot of us understand this. If you say you're saved or you're saved, you're truly saved, you are already married to Christ. You t I, it just, I think if we understood that, we'd live a little more holy. I mean, we're more faithful to, to human spouses than we are to our, our, our Savior. And, and not that that's sad, but it kind of is. I mean, we, we should be more faithful to Christ because the Lord says, you must love me above anybody else. So if you're loving another person or more faithful to another person, more than you are Christ, you're cheating on him. You've created an idol, even if it's your wife or your children. God don't play second place, you know. So we have to understand, he's allowed you to be earthly married, but why is there no marriages in heaven? Why won't I be married to Lonnie? Because we're marrying Christ. We would be adulterers if we were married to each other in heaven. And it's, and it's like, you're an adulterer now if you're cheating on Christ. And that don't bother some of us. And see, that should bother you. It should bother you just as much if you were cheating on your physical spouse. Right? I mean, it should. It bothers me that it doesn't bother people, but whatever. So the third step was the marriage supper or the feast. I'm, now, I'm going back to the, the Jewish ceremony. Okay, so just when the bridegroom got his bride and brought her back to the house, that's, that's the marriage ceremony. Then they did what? They had a feast. Okay, so that's what we see now in Revelation uh, 7, 9, he saith unto me, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage. We'll talk about who they are in a minute. Supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. So we see that now we go from the marriage of the Lamb to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So this is still part of the celebration. So the third step was the marriage supper in a Jewish earthly relationship or a feast. Now listen, guests had already been called and assembled. They were already there. They were waiting back at the father's house while he and his best man or whomever went and got her, came back. They were there, okay? They were there, they assembled, they were ready. Now, who in heaven is already there? There's going to be people in heaven that attend this supper, okay? And we'll look at that. Okay, so once the marriage has been consummated by the bride and the groom, and we know what that means physically, right? They would go into another room. The house was empty. They, the guests would be outside. They would consummate the marriage, they would announce to the best man or whoever outside the door, it's been consummated. Then they would come into the house and they would have this grand feast, okay? And guess how long it lasted? For seven days. So the consummation happened immediately. As soon as he went and got his bride, went back to the house, it happened that night. Then they had a seven-day feast. Well, how long is the tribulational period? It's seven years. It's one week. It's Daniel's 70th week. So thus the marriage supper lasted for one week uh, on earth. 
And there are all sorts of examples. Uh, you go through Genesis, and we'll get them as we go through in Sunday school. You will see all the examples of the Jewish wedding ceremonies and the feasts with Jacob and all the Old Testament um, patriarchs. Okay. So this is what we conclude. So in the, in the actual three steps in Jewish marriage versus what we are reading here in Revelation 19, 7, 9. So we're looking at earthly marriages versus, versus this heavenly marriage. So we can conclude this. The betrothal of Christ and the church is taking place right now. People that get saved, if you're saved, you are betrothed. People are still getting saved until that trumpet blows. People are still joining into the wedding ceremony, into the bride uh, of Christ, into the body of Christ. Okay? In the future, Christ will continue to take his bride. If tomorrow people are getting saved, again, they join this, the body of Christ. Um, okay, so I want to look at the passages here. They're familiar passages, but again, it, it's just very important to do so. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16-18, when people tell you, I, I don't believe in the rapture, I, I, I struggle with believing in the rapture, I... Who cares? I mean, like, that doesn't make it less real. Like, just because the human mind struggles with it, I had someone in the church tell me that. I struggle with believing. Well, that doesn't change reality. You know, I struggle to believe what, what Juneau, Alaska is like, but it doesn't mean it's not there and it's not very cold. And, and I don't know how you get around this, okay? So when we read 1 Thessalonians, Thessalonians 4, 16, remember, this is Christ coming to get his bride. And what has he been doing? What is he doing now? John chapter 14, I go to prepare a place for you. He's been preparing a home. We know the homes could be better than the current home that we have. We know that. I'm going to be really disappointed if it's not. But then he has to come get us. Okay, verse 16, for the Lord himself. Okay, why is the Lord coming back to get his church? Why don't he send Michael? The Catholics believe Mary is going to come get the church. Why is Jesus coming to get the church? Because the bridegroom always gets his bride, okay? So he's coming for his bride. He shall descend from heaven. Now, what we know in Scripture is there's three heavens. John, or Paul says that. Paul said, I was taken up into the third heaven. So what we call heaven would be our atmosphere. The second heaven would be outer space. And when Paul is referring to a third heaven, he's referring to where God resides beyond outer space. No human eye has ever seen that. Human eye hasn't seen 90% of outer space, less the space where God is. So he's going to descend from heaven, his heaven, with a shout, with the voice of an archangel. Now the archangel here plays the role of best man. The best man would actually blow a trumpet. Uh, if Billy Jack was going back for Harley, God help him, he would, um, he would have a best man, and they would have this little this procession, and I'd be in the background going, Billy, don't do it. No, I mean, I would be saying, uh, but they would blow a horn, and see, she would be so excited because she would knew that year's about coming, and it would normally be nighttime, and that horn would blow, and she'd be so happy because Billy Jack's coming to get her, and she would, she's been preparing herself for that night, and he's going to take her back to the new home that he's built, and they're going to have this beautiful life. So that's what the Lord's doing here. So the archangel's the best man with the trump of God. He's got a special trump that he's going to blow that I believe only the believers are going to hear. Okay, I think that's what makes it the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Why are they rising first? No, because they're six feet lower than we are, right? Don't they need a head start? I feel like they do. Um, I feel like they do, you know, but we don't exactly know why. So dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive. Now, and again, I have people tell me, I, I doubt the rapture event. I don't see the work. I, I call this the rapture event, okay? You know, you can call it the rapture. You can call it by the Greek word, harpezo. You can, you can call it the catching up, the snatching away. You can call it whatever you want. It doesn't deny the events in here. So those of us that are alive, verse 17, that remain, and there's the word, shall be caught up. If you look it up in the Greek, it's harpezo, harpazo. It's, it means snatched away. The Lord is going to come and snatch us out of here, take us where? To these houses he's been building in heaven. And, and notice where we're going to meet him, in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. So it's permanent. Like I've said, if you make it to this point, you're there. Um, but boy, what a, what a beautiful day that's going to be. You know, we just got that, e that EBS. What if that was a trumpet, right? That would have been nice. Um, God would say at 224, be ready, right? Some of y'all have really been doing some cleaning up. And then we read in verse 18, wherefore comfort one another with these words. You know, so when people say they don't believe in the rapture, I, I, the first place I take them is here. I, explain that to me if this isn't a rapture of 
the church, the bride? What, what is this if not the rapture? And I've never gotten a good answer. And is it a fake event? Is it a, a fictitious event? Is Paul just making this up? If that was the case, why would he say in verse 18, comfort one another with this? He wouldn't give a fictitious event and then say, hey, comfort yourself with that. This is a real event. And he says, you know what, comfort yourself knowing that the Lord is going to come back and get his bride, take us to heaven, and we will forever be uh, with our Lord and Savior. And, and what a beautiful thing. So at that moment, when we are snatched away, we are in the presence of Christ. And we read about that in Revelation 7, um, verse 9, when you see this great multitude before the throne. Okay, that's, that's our marriage. How's the consummation of it? Maybe it's the communion table, right? Remember when he says, we will do this again? He talked about the communion. Maybe that's the consummation of it. Okay, and then what? Then we have this grand feast. I mean, imagine the food there. Just imagine this feast in heaven, okay? So again, it's going to take place in heaven. Why? Because on the earthly marriage, whenever they had the, the grand feast, it was always at the father's house, not at the bride's house. So when this marriage supper of the lamb takes place, it'll be in the father's house. It'll be in heaven. Is anybody getting goosebumps? I almost get goosebumps talking about this. So it'll definitely be in heaven, not on earth. Now, I'm going to teach you in a minute, probably something you have no idea about. There's another um, marriage supper, okay? And we'll look at that in a minute. But where people really get unhinged in their eschatology concerning Jesus' the second coming. Now, when I say eschatology, I'm just talking about the timeline of events, okay? They, they get the rapture and the second coming all discombobulated. And I've heard so many horrible comments about this and get on Facebook, and people are just so unlearned. So the rapture is not the second coming of Jesus Christ, okay? Some people say it is, it's twofold. It's not. It's, 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 the second coming is one event. The rapture is one event. There are two separate events at two different times. But again, when people deny the rapture, then I guess they have to say it's the second coming. I, I don't know what they say. But the rapture is simply Christ staying in, in the air, calling up the bride to the Father's house. Second coming means he has to step foot on earth. Well, he's not doing that at the rapture. We meet him in the air. That's very clear. So we meet him. That's immediate. We're in the presence of God. That is our marriage. It's consummated for whatever. Then we have a seven-year feast in heaven. A seven-year party, right? It's not a bender. Don't worry, Harley. You're not. There's none of that there. We're going to be. She's like, seven-year party? Yeah. No. I, I think when I say that, like seven years, it sounds like a long time here, but in heaven, is seven years anything? I mean, it's, we're in eternity. There's no clocks there. So, you know, I, it sounds long now, but, you know, I, I have no idea how long it'll feel in heaven. But in Daniel gives a prophecy, and, and I think it's in Daniel 9, where he talks about when Christ came and, and was crucified, that cut the Jews off. And, and they had a 490-year prophecy with the gospel. And, and when they cut Christ off, it stopped at 483 years, and, and God owes the Jews seven more years. Well, God will give them the seven years, but where's the church during them seven years? We're, we're in heaven, okay? So that'll be the fulfillment of that. And then the second coming is when? After the wedding supper of the Lamb, the Bible says we return. The bride of Christ, Jesus Christ, returns. We're going to see that in Revelation. If you go to Jude, which is right before Revelation, Jude actually talks about that, and Jude quotes Enoch, uh, believe it or not, and they say there's a book of Enoch, but if we needed it, it would be in the Bible. But in Jude 14, he quotes Enoch. He says, and Enoch also, if you're wondering what chapter, there's no chapters. Jude 14, and Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these things, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands, that's plural, of his saints, to execute judgment upon all, to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and all of their hard speeches and ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So what we see here in Jude, and we're going to see in Revelations consistent in the next couple of verses, that when Jesus comes at his second coming, this is after the marriage, this is after the marriage supper, Jesus is going to return. Why? Because what's going on at the end of them seven years? We've already looked at it in Revelation. There's an existential threat against Israel. All the nations are coming against Israel, and they are not going to win the war that's coming. The Antichrist is there, the false beast. All these things are happening. It's the battle of Armageddon. So when Christ comes back, he's going to judge these armies, and who's behind them? We are. Are the angels there? No doubt the angels are there. 
Um, so this is going to be, are we going to be fighting? I, I used to read about this when I was small or hear about it. And I was scared because I thought we were coming into war and I'd have to fight, you know, people. And it's like Christ, our general, is going to be in the front. He's going to speak. The armies of the world are going to die. He's going to throw the Antichrist and the false prophet in a lake of fire like that. And there is going to be no war. Trust me, man can't war against God. But that's his second coming. The second coming, he has to put his feet on the earth, okay? That doesn't happen at the rapture. The second coming, he will. And they are sep separate events, separated by at least seven years, okay? Um, and I say at least because there, are, there could be gaps that, we don't, uh, that we're unaware of, okay? If you, let's see. Here's what I want to tell you. If you go to Isaiah, Isaiah 25. Isaiah is about in the middle of your Old Testament. If you're in Jeremiah, keep going left. I always go to Jeremiah for some reason. Isaiah 25, I want to read you a passage, verses 6 to 12, because there's another marriage supper. So Christ is marrying the New Testament church at this marriage and this marriage supper, but a lot of people don't understand there's going to be another marriage supper. And this is promised in Isaiah and other places, but this is probably as clear as it gets. In Isaiah 25, starting at verse 6, Isaiah writes, And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts, so he's talking future events, uh, make unto all people, look, a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow of wines on the lees, well refined. He will destroy in his mountain the face of the covering, cast over all the people and the veil that is spread over all nations. Uh, and again, that's what he's doing at, at uh, Armageddon. He will swallow up death and victory. The Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. We know that's when all this has taken place in Revelation. The rebuke of his people shall he take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken it. He has not done that yet. Israel is still a rebuke. Verse 9, and it shall be said in that day, again, there's a future tense here, this is our God, we have waited for him. And that's what Israel's doing right now. He will save us, this is the Lord, we have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Uh, again, this is, these are Jews, and understand, they're not, they're not talking to Christ here, they're talking about God the Father. For in this mountain, verse 10, shall the hand of the Lord rest, and Moab shall be trodden down under him, even as straw is trodden down for the dunghill. And he shall spread forth his hands in the midst of them, as he that swimmeth spreadeth forth his hands to swim. He shall bring down their pride together with their spoils of their hands, and the fortress of the high fort of thy wall shall bring down, lay low, and bring to the ground, even to the dust. But if you go back and focus on verse 6, you see this great feast. Um, and there is a future feast coming between, guess who? Not Christ and the church, but this is between God and Israel. And this is going to happen on the earth, probably at the start of the millennial reign. Okay? So there's another great feast coming. And it's very, very neat because when you study the promises to the church, they're all heavenly promises. We're not promised anything on this earth. Every promise given to the believers is a heavenly promise. The Bible says when we come to Christ, we are seated in the heavenlies with Christ. But when you study the nation of Israel, all the promises are earthly. So our marriage supper takes place where? Heaven. Israel's takes place where? On earth. And millennial goes back to a Old Testament kind of worship. They're going to have their temple again. They'll be making sacrifices because whenever Jews are in the presence of God, there has to be sacrifices. So it's really neat how where everything started, it kind of goes back. But in that process of God dealing with Israel, like, like we're studying in Sunday school, what are we studying? God dealing with who? Abram. Well, that's the start of the nation of Israel, right? So he starts with them, he ends with them, but in between is us. It's that unnatural branch that was grafted into the natural tree. And it's like for, for millennia, God has kind of divorced he, he, the Bible says he gave them a, a, an issue of divorce, a, 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 a decree of divorce, but it's not permanent. You know, it, it's like a separation, you know, and it's not like God saying, hey, I'm going to see other people. But the Jews did. The Jews said, hey, I'm going to see other gods. And God said, because of that, I'm going to give you an issue, a, a decree of divorcement. But he, he, it's not permanent. And God is going to come back and restore the nation of Israel. And Paul wrote in Romans that Israel will get saved in a day when, uh, right here, when you get to verse 11, and I'm just reading ahead a little bit, he says, I saw, behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him called faithful and true and righteous and do it, judge and make war. This is Christ coming out of heaven. I mean, John says, I see heaven open up. Uh, he's looking through space. I mean, he sees into the third heaven in this vision. He says, I see Christ coming on a white horse. That's when Israel will believe. You know, because when Jesus ascended in Acts chapter 1, 
he was lambada is the word. He was slowly going up on a cloud. And two angels said, ye men of Galilee, why, why do you stare in amazement? The same Christ that you see leaving on a cloud one day will come back out of the clouds. But see, that's when Israel will believe. Israel's so stiff-necked, so stubborn. Again, there's this existential threat. The nations of, of the world are coming against them. And then all of a sudden the sky splits open and, and here comes Christ on a white horse with his army of us, these angels. What is man going to do? You know, but they, in their pride, they still try to make war. It's kind of like some of us, right? We know what we do is wrong, but we still shake our fists in defiance, think we can fight God, and you're not going to win. You know, you can rip them off with your money, rip them off with your time, your talents. You're not going to win. You can't beat God. It's just that simple. And if we would just submit, if man would just submit to God, what a, what a better world we'd have. But it won't. And that's why all this evil's taking place. That's why everything in our world's happening now. It's all leading to this. And the only one that can set the order back in this world is Christ, and he has to return. Um, but at that point of the return, again, we've already been seven years in heaven, the marriage supper, all these beautiful things have happened. And um, I want to just touch on real quickly, though, the they. I, I said I would talk about they which are called in verse 9, Revelation 19, 9. They which are called. So who are these they? So what we've got to establish, too, is remember at the earthly one, I said before the, the bridegroom returned back to his house with the bride, the wedding party was already there. The people were there. So we have to assume before we get up to the marriage that we have with Christ, the minute of the rapture, I mean, how, how quick is that event? What, how did Paul describe it in 1 Corinthians 15? The twinkling of an eye. It's quicker than you can blink your eye. Um, and also, too, twinkling of an eye in Jewish terms can also mean in the evening. Um, but that's splitting hairs. But anyway, um, so it's going to be like that. You know, if we're, it could happen right now. We're like that. We're there. So we're married. Okay? So that means people's already there. It's not the dead in Christ. I, I think they're catching up to us. We're, we're, we're just, but who's there now? Where's Noah? Where's Moses? Where's Samson? Where, where are all these guys at? They're there. Their souls are there. Their spirits are there. They will get their bodies. When we get our bodies at the rapture, they will get their bodies. Um, just think about this. He says to them, he says to John, um, right, blessed. <laughs> I find it funny the angel has to tell John to write sometimes. Like, he's in such amazement. He's like, and the angel's like, uh, write this down, <laughs> right? Like he's reminding him, are you supposed to be writing, John? Um, it's, I find that funny anyway. I can't blame John. I, you know, he's probably sitting there with his mouth open, what he's seeing and forgetting to write. But write it down and bless it. So that's the first thing he says, like, write blessed. Blessed are they. You know, think, so think about it. What's it mean to be blessed? They're blessed to be in heaven. So this group's in heaven, so that's a blessing. Um, they're blessed to be able to see this beautiful marriage ceremony that Christ is about to have. And again, they have to be believers. So the guests must be Old Testament saints. So in our wedding party, or the v people viewing our wedding with Christ will be King David, Moses, Noah, Elijah, Jacob, Isaac, you know, name, name an Old Testament prophet, Jeremiah. They're going to be there. They're going to be, you know, these guys... We're given glimpses uh, of future events, um, but there was no church in their time. There, there was no church. In fact, when Paul was even writing, it was still the mystery of the church. Nobody really understood what the church was uh, apart from Christ. So this group is going to be there. I don't know if you look forward to this day. Um, I do. And, and if you've been physically married and you're excited about that, you should be excited about this day if you're truly saved. If, you, if you're, again, I, if you're not excited about this day, it tells me that maybe the Holy Spirit's not in you because I can tell you right now, the Holy Spirit longs for this day. It, it longs for this day. And the Holy Spirit brings out of him what's in, it'll bring it out of you. You know, when you're living in sin and you're grumpy and you're nasty, trust me, you're bubbling with that. It's coming out because you're grieving the Holy Spirit. But when you hear about events like this, the Holy Spirit just, leaps with joy. And, and if you don't feel that joy or anticipation of looking for this day, I'd really question if the Holy Spirit's in you because it's not, it's not a happiness you need to muster up. It, it's the Holy Spirit's just, I mean, it, where else does the Holy Spirit want to be than back in heaven um, with, with Christ and God? So the angel concludes verse 9 by stating, these are not my words. So, and, and I think sometimes the angel says that because some of the things that he's showing John are just so far beyond human understanding, so far beyond human imagination, and the angel doesn't want any glory for what's happening here. The angel tells John at the end of verse 9, like, look, these are not my words. These are not the words of any man. 
But these are the words of God. What, what I am telling you are the words of God, and they will happen. Because I know it's hard for us to read Scripture sometimes and see things about heaven and even a message like about hell. It's hard to picture it. It's hard to believe the reality of it. But when an angel tells uh, another man of God that this is God's word and it will happen, you better bank on it. Uh, so it doesn't matter what man says. The Bible says in Romans, um, let God be true and all men a liar, because men do lie. After this tremendous vision, and, and look what it does to John. You know, Daniel gets a vision of the horror of the Antichrist, and he actually passes out. He faints. It, it was that horrific what he saw, and he, he passed out. In contrary, John gets this vision here in verse 10, and he says, I fell at his feet to worship him. Why? Well, he's the one giving him the vision. The angel's giving him the vision. He's the only one there. And John is just so overwhelmed, he falls down um, at the feet of this angel, and the angel says, get up. And, and this is really, really neat. He says, don't worship me, in verse 10. He says, I am your fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, I find this really interesting because John is so overcome with joy this angel is the same angel that's been giving him the same vision since chapter 17 of Babylon's destruction, the judgment, all these things. Same angel, same vision, it's just changing. So John's been with his angel for a while, um, and John is just overwhelmed at this point. The vision's still going on, but John's like just overwhelmed, and he, and he falls to worship, you know, and it's not a bad thing. Um, and a lot of people, you know, we want to, John shouldn't have done that. He shouldn't have worked with an angel. If I was there, I would have never done that. Don't say that kind of stupid stuff because you don't know what you would do if you were getting a heavenly vision from an angel of God. Um, you probably would have fell out before John did. But what's neat here is he tells, he tells him, he says, I am just like you. I, I'm just a servant of God. Now, we know angels are spirit beings and, and such things, but the way the angel looked at himself is, I'm just a created being like you are. No pride in this angel, um, no wanting to be more than what he is. And boy, if the church would operate that way, what a, what a beautiful church we'd have. Squash all pride, um, people acting like they're better than what they are. You know, because if you think you're better than what you are, you are going the wrong direction in your walk with Christ because he is the ultimate picture of humility. And if you're prideful, you are not heading in the direction of Christ. You're heading in the direction of the devil. The devil's full of pride. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. Um, so be careful what you start to think of yourself. And Peter uh, wrote in Scripture, don't forget where you were when Christ found you. It don't matter who you become, how knowledgeable you are. And again, you know, the devil's got more knowledge of the Bible than you do. So don't think your knowledge makes you superior. It, it's, it's your humility that makes you superior. And we've been studying that. And again, it's not something you have to do. When you, when you become like Christ, humility comes natural. Yeah, that's a good sign of growth. If you are a prideful person, you see the humility coming into your character. That's a good sign of growth. What does pride do? It destroys, but, but, but what does it do? It stops you from acknowledging your sin. It stops you from repenting. That's why a prideful person is resisted by God, because he's not going to deal with a stubborn donkey. Who would? He won't. Why? Because you're unworkable. You know, the, and, and, and the sad thing is, if you really understood that you are just the clay and he's the potter, like, like, what does the clay have to boast about? Nothing. You know, so when you really look at your life, what did Jesus say in John 15, verse 5? Without me, you can do nothing. I'm the trunk. You're just a branch. Now, he loves you as a branch, but what can a branch do on its own? You know what it does? It withers and dies. And Jesus said, such a branch is good for the fire. But where do we get our power? Where do we get, you know, the, the apple tree can't, the branch can't boast of itself. Because without the trunk of the tree and getting the nutrients it needs, it would never produce an apple. So we can't produce anything on our own, nothing of a deity, but we can reflect. And again, we're called to be image bearers of God, but on our own we can do nothing. So there's nothing we can boast about, absolutely nothing. You know, I, I don't get where the pride and the boasting comes from in the church. I, I really don't. I, I, it's just, it's odd to me. But angels are like men, in fact, are just created, uh, and only the creator, uh, the angel says here, is worthy of worship. I want to read what Paul wrote in Colossians chapter 2, verse 18. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Oh, we're shooting in here. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 18, Paul wrote this. 
There's a lot of verses, but he says, let no man beguile you, that means trick you, of your reward in a, in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. He's warning people, don't worship angels. Do people worship angels today? Sure they do. Um, what's the biggest one? What's the biggest worshiping of an angel? You've heard of it. Satanism, right? Isn't he an angel? Right? So that's the biggest worshiping of an angel. And, you know, and that's why Paul wrote in Galatians 1, 8, 9, if anyone comes to you preaching anything other than Christ crucified, even what? Even if it's an angel, let him be accursed. Why? Because angels can disguise themselves as angel of light, 2 Corinthians 11, right? So very deceptive, and that's why he says, don't let any person beguile you. That's a good warning for people. Again, I say let the Bible speak for itself. Don't let another human come and trick you into believing something outside of Scripture, some man-made theology. And that's what's happened to the church. There's all these divisive things, all these man-made theologies, Calvinism, Reformation, all these things. And if you notice the names of them, they're all named after who? People. So people are bringing their thoughts into the Word of God, and they twist and they tweak, and they, they just do enough things to make it sound close, but... God's Word doesn't need to be tweaked. It just needs to be read, studied, and understood, and taken for what it says. Um, and again, if an angel comes and says something different than the Word of God, if I teach you something different than what this Bible is saying, don't listen to me. Take me out front and flog me, okay? We have some roof tar back here. I don't think we got feathers, but we do have roof tar. So why do people worship angels? Why do people worship angels? I mean, Satan's an angel, right? It's deception, and that's why he says here, don't beguile, don't let people beguile you. Don't let other angels beguile you. Think about Ouija boards, all the beguiling in that, um, soothsayers, crystal ball readers, tarot card readers. It's all that beguiling, um, and it's demonic. All of it's demonic. But Satan wants what? He craves worship. It's a fact. And he has so many people worshiping him and his fallen angels, and guess what? They don't even know they're doing it. Most people that worship the devil and the demons don't even realize they're doing it. Again, you know, alcohol, drugs, it's all demonic. And when you take part in it, you're worshiping the devil. And you call yourself a Christian, but I'm, you're really a Satan worshiper. No, I am not. Yes, you are. You can't serve two masters. You can't have God giving you something and the devil giving you something, and you're saying, I'm a, I'm a follower of God. Now, does that mean God can't work these things out in your life? Of course he can. But you've got to be willing to let them. You know, again, God's not forcing anything upon anybody. We've all got free will. I think everybody in this room has a, at least one issue that God needs to work out of their life. So you're not by yourself. You know, you're not in this, you're not in like the spotlight battle with God. I mean, everybody in the world has some type of issue they need to work out. Um, but the, the question is, are you trying to work it out? Are you trying to let God work it out? And I, I think everyone here certainly is, or you wouldn't be here tonight because you're, unless you're being, unless you're, you were a drug here, I don't know, but if you free will came here, it's because you want the best that God has to offer, and, and it's a process. So I just want to encourage you, if, if you're young in the faith and you, you still say, I got all these problems, I've been doing my best, God's working them out. It, it's that simple. If you're giving your heart to God, he's working them out. Again, a tree doesn't produce fruit overnight. It takes time. So the angel says, in all humility, I'm not worthy. Worship uh, God only. I, I am your fellow servant. And he says, and of your brethren. Angels are used by God to do what? Serve him, to, to perform his will. That's what the four riders are of the, the first four seals, the, the, the black, the white, the gray, and the, the pale rider, the black rider. They're, they're angels, and they go out and they do the will of God. They raise up kings. They bring down kings. They do the will of God. And that's why the angel says, of your fellow brethren here, because to the angel, he's telling John, look, I'm not special. I'm doing the same thing you're doing. He's a human being, but he's doing what? He's a servant of God. He's doing the will of God. That's what angels do. And that's why he says, I'm just like you and your fellow brethren. Um, granted, angels probably do it a lot better, but you see the humility of the angel here, understanding that I'm only doing what you're doing, John, so don't worship me. And what is the mission of every believer? It's not to be like an angel, but it's not a bad first step to be like an angel. I mean, because an angel does what? Gives glory to God. It serves God. It does the will of God. Again, I'm not... Once you leave her at night telling you to be Michael, you know, our goal was Christ. He's the high mark. But if you ended up like Michael, that wouldn't be so bad, right? 
When we come to Christ, we are called the what? The sons of God, the children of God, men and women, the children of God. And it's interesting to learn that the angels simply look at themselves as our fellow brothers. And the Bible says when we get to heaven, we will rule over the angels. So you talk about humility. Imagine being an angel and you've served God and you've praised him your whole existence. And here comes this bunch of hypocritical, idolater people that call themselves Christians and they make it to heaven by the skin of their teeth and they get to roll over Michael, Michael the archangel. Imagine that. But that's the promise of God. If that don't tell you how much God loves you, and why is he going to let us roll over the angels? Because we had to make a decision to be there. The angels didn't. Okay? And you can argue they had a decision when Satan fell. You don't know what that, you don't know what happened that day. I don't know what happened that day. But, and again, I don't mean to harp on it, but I, I had to deal with Calvinism years ago with a lot of college kids in this church. This isn't the first time it's come in here. I just want to make a point. If God was picking and choosing people, then why would we reign above the angels? See, we reign because we're making a free will choice in a demonic, dark world. If you're saved, you chose Christ, and that means something to him. And for that, he's going to reward you and put you in the heavenlies with Christ. Well, Christ is above the angels. We will sit with Christ. We will rule above the angels. That's how much the Lord honors a person's decision for him. You know, if it was being forced, why, there would be nothing to honor. It's not love. There's so many holes in that theology, it's not even worth getting into. 1 John 5, I want to read this. 1 John 5, 9 and 10. It talks about uh, what we're talking about here. So 1 John, again, John is the author of Revelation. He wrote the book of John, and he wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. But in 1 John 5, I want to read verses 9 and 10. And this chapter talks about the believer's victory. It says, If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. That's the Holy Spirit. He that, believeth, who, he that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave us of his Son. You see that? Every person that denies Christ. And again, what do you see there? Free will choice. Every person that says, I don't believe in God, I don't believe that Jesus Christ is God, is calling God a liar to his face. That's what the Bible says. Because what? Because you don't believe the witness of Jesus Christ. You will say, well, I didn't see it, but God gave us witnesses. And he wrote it in a book, and he's preserved it over the millennia for you to have here today, over the centuries. And you either believe it or you do not. But understand this, if you do not believe it, you're calling God a liar. And they will stand before God and have to say, I called you a liar. But they will call him Lord, and every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that he is Lord when they stand before him. But right now, they call him a liar. Our world, pretty much right now, says God's a liar. Um, even if you read scripture and you don't abide by it, pretty much calling God a liar. Um, because if God's word is prominent in your life and in your heart, doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. But when you keep putting a perfect word in your heart, because he's already given us a perfect spirit, it, it rages against the flesh. But God doesn't want us living in that everyday full-on battle with our flesh. Your flesh should be dying and dying and dying, and the Holy Spirit should be enlarging, enlarging, enlarging. Not that you get more, but more of you. Now, you don't get more Holy Spirit. He gets more of you. So the more you're letting the Holy Spirit take over in your life and in your heart and give him every area of your life and quit holding back these little dark areas because what? A little bit of leaven makes you better? No, it ruins the whole lump of you. I'm telling you, if you could see yourself, if I could see myself, you think you're getting away, but you're not. It's ruining you. It's destroying you. You'll never become like Christ when you keep sin in your heart. It's not going to happen. And again, we have, a, we have a mission. We have a purpose. Our purpose isn't to get saved and, and fight sin our whole life. Our, our purpose is to get saved, let God deal with the sin in our life, and then go out here and try to save other people. That, that's, that's our mission. To go out and, and if we're battling ourselves all the time, who are you going to help? Nobody. Your battle's you. God didn't save you. He's already won that battle. He's defeated the sin in your life. You can't forget it, but, you know, it's like, like I was saying about Abram, the beautiful thing about Abram to learn is to, yeah, you messed up, but he didn't dwell in it. You know, even King David, like, he probably, maybe for a year, but, you know, he repented and moved on because in Psalm 51, he said, Lord, I need my joy back. I, I need the joy of my salvation. You know, and, and that's why God gave us salvation, to, to be joyful. 
not to be miserable and, you know, remind us of our sin. That's the devil reminding you of your past. Jesus said, I've made you a new creature in Christ. You know, it, we, as humans, we, we try to get in the mind of God. I know I do at times, and my mind is so feeble, I, I can't get in anybody's mind. But when we talk about forgetting, we can't do that. Especially you women, y'all don't forget nothing. <laughs> Bob, shake your head. See? He forgets, like, minute by minute, right? He said his mind's like an Etch-a-Sketch. He said if I shake it, it's just like reset. So... He said that's how he stayed married so long. But anyway, um, I've noticed all the spouse, everyone's sitting apart tonight. I, it, all the spouses are sitting separate tonight. And I, it's, it's so odd that, um, you know, last week the message of Mark, you know, following the Pastor Mark was about hell. Well, this week it's about marriage. And like everybody, all the spouses are sitting separate. And I got thinking, and I get, well, you're, you're not, most everybody. But I got thinking about it, I said, it's pretty unique that, you know, we, we talked about hell last week, and now we're talking about marriage this week. <laughs> but anyway, um, I wouldn't understand that at all. <laughs> Let's get through this. So the angel reiterates, worship God only. Remember when uh, the devil came to Jesus in the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4? What did the devil want Jesus to do? Bow down and worship him, right? And what did Jesus say? The word of God says, only worship God. So... All revelation given by God uh, through his prophets was by the Spirit, and the Spirit only came to testify of Christ. And that's what that means here at the end of verse 10. Jesus is the Spirit of prophecy, meaning all revelation was given by God to his prophets. It was by the Spirit, and the Spirit only came to testify of Christ. The, the, the prophets of the Old Testament didn't realize it, but they were testifying of Christ. They didn't know who Christ was. They didn't know who God was to a point. But half the prophecies, or probably 90% of the prophecies they gave, they did not understand. Um, there's some other verses we could read, but I don't have time. But uh, it really just speaks about Christ being the prophecy. Acts chapter 1, verse 16, uh, if you want to write them down, look at them. Speak about Christ being um, the testimony of prophecy. John 15, verse 26. John 16, verse 13. Again, John 16, you know, that's where the Lord's saying, I'm going to go, I'm going to send a comforter. But the comforter's only coming to testify of Christ. You know, in our world... The Holy Spirit did not come to elevate me, did not come to elevate you, did not come to elevate any person. And that's why I say we've got to get away from following people, teachers, and, and just follow the Word of God and lift up the name of God and testify of Jesus Christ because the Bible says there's no salvation in any other name. You know, you can lift up some Dwight L. Moody and, and, and Billy Graham, and they're great guys, but guess what? There's no salvation in their name. So before you talk about this old guy and that old guy, why don't you talk about Christ? Because you could be having the last conversation you ever have with somebody. They could be about to die. They don't need to hear how great Billy Graham was. They need to hear about Jesus Christ. Um, and we don't know how much time people have and how much time we have. And it's just imperative that we hand tracks out um, wherever we can. You know, it's amazing. Go wash your hands in a bathroom in a restaurant. Leave a track up there. Um, leave one on the urinal. Leave... Leave on, a lot of places have pegboards. Leave one there. Leave them with your waiter, your waitress. You meet somebody on the street getting gas. Here, you know, do you want this? You know, and if they don't want it, that's fine, you know, but they may. I mean, we, we've had a little waitress we had at uh, Olive Garden a couple weeks ago. She was so excited when we gave her the thank you track. We walked out. We were leaving. She was about to show it to another uh, waitress in, in the kitchen, you know. Now, we've walked by before and seen them throwing them away, but that's okay. Maybe the trash man will find it, right? But... You just don't know. It's not, our, it's not our job to try to figure out who's going to read it and who's not going to read it. It's just our job to distribute it, to plant the seeds. So um, wherever God plants you, you know, bloom. It's that simple. You know, it's easy to come in here tonight and praise God when everything's going great. I'll appreciate it more when things are going horrible and you still come in here and praise God. You know, that's where you know you're growing in your life. It's, it's like the Lord said, you can love anybody who loves you back, but try loving your enemy. That's, that's when you know you have a real faith. You know, and it, it's, it's easy when the sun's out. But when the rain comes, you can praise God during the rain. That's a beautiful thing. Now, should we praise God when the sun's out? Certainly we should. Certainly we should. But, you know, it's, it's, it's like David said, you know, and I agree with David. David's walk with Christ or with God was like this. It was like on the mountain and the valley, on the mountain and the valley. And David says at some point, he's like, Lord, can I just have some level ground? You know, can, can you just give me some level ground? I, I get tired of the highs and the lows. And David's one minute, everything's great. Next time he's being hunted by, by his his king, you know, and David's like, just give me some level ground. It's all I want every now and again. And, and I just want to encourage you, 
I've seen it, we've seen it when we were involved with the college kids a lot and, you know, some of them would recently get saved. They, they, were, they were on fire. Their tails were on fire. They're ready to do this, do that. And I would tell them, and I hate to tell somebody, slow down. You know what I mean? You hate to say that. But, and they, they just, they were like shooting stars. And next thing you know, I mean, we've seen some of them on Facebook recently and had to unfriend them because it's just, boy, you're not the person you were a few years ago that I knew. And the world just got a hold of them again. And it's just wicked. I mean, wicked. But coming to Christ isn't a fad. It's not something you start and stop and start and stop. It's, if it's real, you'll stay with it. Um, I've seen people leave for various reasons. I can't say they were phonies or anything. I'm not judging people. But when, when the Holy Spirit's in you, you crave the Word of God. And, and I hate to say it, you need a church like this where the Bible's taught because entertainment won't satisfy you. In contrary, if you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, you need a church that entertains you. Because the Word of God don't do nothing for you, you know. And again, people talk about feeling the Holy Spirit. I don't encourage you to feel the Holy Spirit. I encourage you to see the Holy Spirit working in your life, and that's that should encourage you. Again, if you're an angry person and you're not so angry anymore, that's the Holy Spirit working in you, and that that's encouraging. And um, patience is a big one. If you are a very impatient person, all of a sudden you notice more patience. It's the Holy Spirit working in you, and these are fruits of God. Because when you can walk around in a world and be patient and loving and show kindness and mercy, and you realize you're not faking it, that could only be done through a divine spirit. So that is the Holy Spirit doing it in you. And that's, a well, it's definitely a sign you're saved, but it's a better sign that you're allowing God to work in you. Because people like me that were saved in the church at a young age, um, like my kids, sometimes it's hard, like, are you just doing it because that's how you were raised? Are you just doing it because that's the pattern that you've been raised in? And then when you get older, are you just doing it because still that's what mom and dad want? Or are you just doing it because it just feels like the right thing? And I see a lot of people that were saved at a young age, they don't often surrender their heart to Christ, and they just kind of go through the motions because they just feel like it's the right thing to do. And, and that's, that's sad to me because it's just sad. It's just, it's just sad. But I, I just pray that... People don't base their salvation on, I've been in church since I was five, or, um, you know, mom and dad led me in a prayer when I was five. That's not salvation. Salvation is seeing yourself as a sinner, calling upon the name of the Lord to save you, and it's real, and you're crying over your sin. I mean, I've, I've often said if you haven't had that prayer where you at least had a really heavy godly sorrow over your sin and repented unto God, you haven't truly been saved. Because it's, it's not a willy-nilly, Lord, I'm sorry, can you save me? It's not that. It, it's a real conviction of heart, and it's a change of nature. You know, there has to be a change of nature. Um, has to happen. New creatures can't walk in the same direction constantly. They can't. So, any questions? So, do you understand this, this, the the timeline? We're spouse now. We're betrothed. So we are already married to Christ. It becomes official at the rapture when we're in His presence. That's the marriage. And then the marriage, the supper of the Lamb takes place after that. That's the celebration that lasts a week. That will last seven years. We return with Christ. We, he sets up his kingdom and we rule with him for a thousand years, the millennial. But in that time, I believe at the start of the millennial, God has this great supper, this covenant, this millennial covenant God's going to have with the nation of Israel. And um, they're going to have their temple, their fourth temple. Right now they're on two. Um, they're going to build a third one. It will be destroyed during the tribulational period. And then... Um, They'll build again, and that'll be their fourth temple, and it'll probably make the Temple of Solomon look like a shack. So, imagine the things we will see. Just imagine we will see that temple. We, I just crazy. All right, who wants to close us in prayer? You, you and real quickly, you think about seven years, and again, it's in heaven. Imagine the conversations we can have with people. I just. Okay, I'm done. I just I can't stop thinking about it. I want to talk to Noah so bad. <laughs> just so bad. You know, they, they said they found bones of Noah's family. Did you see that? Did you see their fingers? Are like, yeah, they're like giants. Yeah. That is interesting. Do you think that the growth comes from the years of age? I mean, because they live so much longer? They claim they found the hieroglyphics of, like, the boat, and, the van, and they, 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 they think they found Noah's wife's finger or something. 
Yeah. And there was one where it had like subscriptions of where like the Knights Templar had done the crusade and they had carved the cross and then they, and they found this tomb and they put like Noah's boat and yeah, yeah, yeah. over top of it and the family that yep. was found in this tomb yep. or whatever. It was pretty amazing. Yeah, and they showed like one of... What landed on Mount Ararat, yeah, in Turkey. Yeah, yeah. But that, that was, that was, that was uh, uh, wife's uh, finger, actually, not long. Oh, no. And they showed one of the What was that on? History Channel or something? Uh, I saw that, that post uh, by this finger on Facebook recently, but uh, all, 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 all of a sudden I learned about the Noah's, uh, the discovery of the Ark and stuff. Uh, the was through Ron Wyatt and all his stuff, too, because he has... Stuff about the Red Sea Cross and find chariot wheels. Yeah. yeah. He's, he's, he's done so many things over there and found so many yeah, different yeah. cool cool things. He went, I think the, the whole trail where God uh, took the Israelites to the desert, he found altars with um, uh, menorahs uh, carved in them. Yeah, yeah. They showed the pens where the cattle were, where they had the animals, and they showed the, the rock where. Um, uh, Moses hit it with the staff and split it, yeah, you know what I mean? And the water came out of it, yeah, and, it yeah. and it showed erosion. I mean, there's just so much cool stuff out there. I'll meet you out there. I love that stuff. Yeah. The first thing I saw, I thought I was going to show you the finger. I was like, damn, I should have been back Like that Bible. Yeah. Yeah, that's really But, you know, I think God has been telling them about the artifacts just to worship the artifacts and they'll come more and more artifacts. But it's neat how he releases little things just to kind of validate you know, the Bible as a history book, and it really is, so. All right, cool. Thank you, Billy. Anybody want to close in prayer? I will. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to congregate this evening. Thank you for allowing the wisdom of your words to be passed through from Pastor Dave to us. Thank you for allowing us to learn of what's to come, and thank you for allowing us to be here to <coughs> incorporate it into our lives, to instill the fear of God in us, so that we learn to trust in your word and understand more of what's to come. Thank you for forgiving us, dear Lord, and thank you for allowing us to be here tonight. In holy, precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Uh, don't forget the offering. We're still... <laughs>